Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, why are we doing operating system migration in the first place? And then sort of two main um, ways of doing it, what we call hosted migration, and then this uh, new self-migration that we're doing in our second generation system, uh, how far we got. And then I'm going to talk about the, the new stuff that, that we're moving into, um, that we're calling self-inflation and how we're trying to do accounting. And then um, I'm also going to motivate why we're doing all this stuff. And then I'm going to look into... Uh, yeah, related work, conclusion, that stuff. Oh, sorry. That's it. So why, why do you want to do operating system migration? So I guess people here know uh, process migration. When you want to move a process that's running somewhere, and you, you need to use the resources for somewhere else, so you, you move it to, uh, to a new machine. Well, the problem with... with uh, Right now, with, with uh, grid computing uh, becoming a, a big thing, at least in Europe, where we have uh, clusters with uh, thousands of machines, uh, we have the problem that we cannot preempt jobs. So once we commit a job to a certain uh, CPU, then we need to wait for it to finish before we can use the CPU for something else. So we, we cannot, um, I mean, if it's a three-month job, then we have to wait three months, or we have to terminate the job, and then we have to do all the work that we did prior to terminating it. And then we have the problem that if we want users to submit uh, computation jobs to this, these big clusters, then we need to agree on what is, the, what is the common platform. So does it run Linux or does it run Windows? And what version of Linux, because there are like 10 versions of Linux at least. And what kind of shared libraries should be installed, what kind of uh, security parameters, stuff like that. So, but if, if you're doing operating system migration, you can just let people sort of build their own operating system and then migrate it into the cluster. And then we can migrate it around the cluster to balance the load. Uh, and then you would say, well, if you're only, if you're migrating the operating system, then you can't do time sharing, because usually you don't have more than one operating system. But if you if you put a virtual machine monitor at the bottom of the machine, you can then still run multiple operating system instances. Um, and plus, with a virtual machine monitor, we have much stronger isolation than what would you would have with, say, Unix. So you have uh, you have a very simple security model, and it's much easier to enforce than what you have in, in NT or in Unix. So and then the final problem with, with uh, traditional process migration is uh, what's called the residual dependency problem, that you have a lot of state outside your process that, that you cannot move with you. So say you have two processes sharing memory, and you want to move one to another machine, then that, that's a big problem. And you, you need to send a lot of network traffic along to, to communicate this state. And that slows you down. And even worse, if, if you lose your network link or if you lose the original host, then your process dies, even though it already migrated somewhere else. <coughs> so, um, and then finally, then an operating system expects a very simple interface. It just needs some, some memory pages and some, some disk blocks, and that's it. So that's very easy to specify, instead of having to specify this system runs Linux or whatever. Doesn't it also expect a network interface? That yeah, yeah, I mean, but it's, it's still, I mean, if you say it's, it's, it's Ethernet and it's RAM and it's uh, disk blocks, it's still very stable, simple compared to saying it expects this version of the NT kernel. Or so uh, <coughs> what is the sort of quality experience you get when you're doing uh, operating system migration? So this is the main measurable thing is uh, what we call migration downtime which is like process downtime when you're doing process migration. So if you imagine you want to, to move your job from, from A to B, then the very easy way to do it is just stop it, copy the whole thing, then restart on, on the new machine. And that's what you'd call stop and copy migration. So the problem is that, that your downtime the, will be proportional to the time that, the, to the amount of state that you're copying, right? So, but, but there are some people doing process migration in, and the aiders who found out that you can, you can actually reduce the downtime to being proportional to the, to the writable working set of your application. So the stuff that doesn't change, you just ship that in advance. You keep running, and then you fail over control at, at the last possible point. 
So <coughs> we want to do pre-copy uh, OS migration. So we want, to, we want to keep the operating system running as long as possible on the originating host while we, we, we're copying its state. And then first, first you copy the full state. Then you track all the stuff that's changing. So you do just copy the changes. And then while you're copying the changes, there'll be new changes happening. So you copy the changes to the changes. And so because each uh, iteration will be shorter, you will get fewer changes. And so you will, I mean, so in, in the end, you will just have to move, a, say, 100Ks, and then that will be your downtime. That will be the time to copy 100Ks. And so once, once you're done that, you can just resume on the new host. <coughs> so uh, the first system we did, and uh, <coughs> stuff people like VMware are doing, is what we call uh, hosted migration. So <coughs> this is an example of two systems doing hosted migration. So at the bottom, of course, you have, you have the interface to the hardware. And then you have your virtual machine managers, or microkernels, whatever you call them these days. And then you have some kind of control pane software. So that could be stuff that's running uh, a Windows program running on top of VMware or whatever. And that will, that will do the actual migration for you. So you, you, you copy your operating system via, via the control pane software onto the control pane software uh, of the destination machine. And that means you need to put stuff like a TCP stack, for instance, inside the control pane software. <coughs> you also need fairly um, complex stuff there, because you need, if, if you want to track the, cha the, the, the state changes while this thing is still running, you actually need to be able to impose on stuff like page faults and have access to the page tables of the operating system that's moving. Uh, yeah, of, of the guy that's... Uh, so I want to I move this guy here. And, and um, while I'm copying him, this is making some changes. So how can I track these changes? Well, I would, I would need to sort of mess with his page tables so that they were read-only. And once, once there were page faults, I would, I would need to track these page faults over here so that I knew what, what to retransmit. <coughs> the so so that's, that's not very neat, I think. And, and also, it would be very nice if you could have access to the schedule of the guy, because if there's one process there, inside the OS that's moving, that's moving, that's sort of creating a lot of trouble. It would be nice to sort of be able to, to slow that down a bit. So we don't like that. So what we're trying to do is instead is what we call self-migration. And so, <coughs> so the observation is that, the, that the, the, the operating system that's moving has a TCP st stack already. So it has page tables and has, knows what's in them. And it has a page fault handler and all that stuff. So why don't we have this, the operating system sort of drag itself uh, along the network and, and do that without having any outside uh, assistance from, from the host environment or the microkernel or virtual machine monitor that's running below. And of course, we want to keep running while we're doing this because we want to keep this very low downtime. <coughs> so this is a new and improved model, which is nice and simple. So I want to move this guy over here. And actually, this guy just wants to move over here, and he just moves over here. So that's, that's what he wants to do. And that, that's a bit hard, because you want to checkpoint something that's still moving. And usually, if you want to checkpoint stuff, then you stop, you stop it, you checkpoint, and then you, you, you start running. So that's like Munchausen trying to sort of checkpoint himself out of the swamp, what the story was. So, but there's, there's one very simple way to achieve this, actually. So you just say, uh, if I have a 256 meg machine, I only ever use more than, uh, I only use half of the memory of the machine. And if I want to do a checkpoint, then I just mem copy the stuff that I'm using uh, onto the stuff that I'm not using. And so now I, have, now I have a checkpoint. I can do that. I mean, I, I can do an atomic mem copy. That's sort of hit stuff, right? And then I just use my TCP stack to copy the chip checkpoint. And, but that's sort of a disappointing solution because it, I, I have to, never use more than half my memory. And I'll still have the downtime problem of being, having downtime that's proportional to my footprint, or to half my footprint. So that's not very cool. So, but what we can do is that <coughs> we know from the, from the pre-copy algorithm that we have usually a, a very small working set compared to the, the whole uh, size of the guy that's moving. So if we, if we only do this uh, checkpoint buffer thing, for, for the active working set, then we can, then we can, we can get self-migration without having to allocate a half-hour memory for it. And we can get 
uh, very low system downtime. So we, we use normal pre-copy, and we find out what is, what is the, the, the writable working set. And then essentially we, we fork the thing, uh, and then after the last delta, we send the stuff that we forked. So the stuff that, that we back up, we, we send to the, to the new machine. <coughs> so that means that the, the guy who wants to move, he has to go through all his uh, virtual memory mappings in the system and turn them into write-only uh, mappings. And for every write fault he gets, he needs to lock the, the corresponding page that this mapping points to as being dirty. So it needs to be a retransmit. And so for, he does that over like a number of iterations until he has a, a surprisingly small working set identified. And he just keeps, first he copies the whole thing so everything is dirty, and then he just copies the delta. And then <coughs> uh, finally, instead of just marking stuff as dirty, he actually backs up the pages before they are allowed to get dirty, just like you do in a normal process fork. So I have this sort of animation showing. So on the left side, I have my, my, my source host, and here's my destination. And so the idea is that, that the gray stuff is, is the inconsistent state, and the white stuff is the consistent state. So I'm, when I'm done with this, then the, the right side will be white. And then at the bottom here, I, I've set aside a, a small buffer for my, for my checkpoint. So this is, this is my fancy progress bar going down. So I copied this stuff <coughs> across the network. So I have a lot of uh, consistent state now on, on the destination host. But while I'm doing this, this thing keeps running, and I have mutating threads and stuff like that. So I have some state mutations. That's the red pages here. And I have some more progress and some, some more inconsistent state. So now I did the first uh, complete phase. And I have a big handful of inconsistent pages that I need to retransmit. So. What I'll do, I'll, I'll do the, the delta thing now. So I, I need to get this stuff copied. So now the progress, and that, that looks nice. So I just had three few inconsistencies over here. And I'll do some more progress. But oh no, now I have a new one. And I, I mean, the point is I can, I can keep, keep on with this forever. I'm not ever going to reach a white uh, state on the, on the right side. Because I'll keep mutating this one. Because the process that's doing the migration that's carrying along the data and the TCP stack, all that stuff, also mutates the data. So then I move into the copy and write phase. So the idea is that I copy some more stuff down here, and then I have a new page fold. But instead of just <coughs> marking this thing as dirty, I actually uh, back up the old state before letting the write go through. So I back up the old state in this checkpoint buffer up here. And I go and I have some, some more stuff that changes and I back up the old state. And so after this iteration, I, have, I still have two inconsistencies. But the cool thing is I, have in, I have, do have consistent backups. So now I just need to um, copy these backups there. And now I have a consistent system. I have a checkpoint now of my old system uh, onto the new machine. And then all I need to do now is to uh, shut down the other guy here, and the startup execution over here. And I can free the checkpoint buffer also. So just to recap, I, I have to I like a small bit of memory, but then I can do a self-checkpoint onto another system. And my, my downtime is, is, is fairly low. <coughs> it's still proportional to the size of the working set. <coughs> so, but if perhaps you notice that, that there was a small sort of a time warp backwards. Because I, I, I backed up some stuff, and then I kept running. And then I, I sort of resumed execution from, from the backup stuff. So actually what we have, we have a fork in, of this process onto a new machine. So we have to be a little careful about what's going on during the final phase uh, with regards to other connections. So the idea is I have to firewall all, all unrelated network traffic just during the, the final phase. But that, that firewalling is equal to the downtime of uh, traditional process migration. So <clears throat> what happens to all my IP connections, stuff like that? Well, that, that'll just work. So as long as I'm on the local subnet, then that'll just work. So I can just, I mean, you, you, can, you can plug your laptop into another uh, plug in the wall, and it'll work, work if you keep your IP address. 
Uh, so so what, what you do is you, you send out an ARP reply saying this, this IP address is now on, on this new Ethernet address, if it's Ethernet. And you can do that very quickly. I mean, people will pick up on this. And you, the cool thing is you're inside the, 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 the TCP stack that's moving. So you know the ARP cache. You know exactly who to talk to. You don't even have to broadcast this stuff. Or if you, <coughs> if you feel like it, you can just keep your Ethernet address. And actually, your, your switch will just take care of moving you to a new port, if your hardware supports taking your Ethernet address to, with you to a new machine. So of course, if you go outside the local subnet, you have the, the problem of like taking this laptop outside this building that you need to reconnect and uh, find a new IP address, or you have to you do, use, say, mobile IP or something like that. <coughs> and then also, inside this thing that's moving, you need to if you have state and device drivers inside the virtual machine mines and stuff like that, before you do the fork, you need to sort of flush the state. And right after you do the fork, you, you, you uh, reinitialize the, the devices because, I mean, you need the network device to keep uh, migrating. And then also, but the, but the checkpoint that you're sending will, will be a checkpoint with all this stuff shut down, so you can just nicely just plug into the new machine and you'll just keep running. So how does this work? Well. We have this implemented in uh, Xeno Linux, which is uh, sort of a ring one port of Linux that's running on top of Xen. Xen is the virtual machine manager from Cambridge. And it's about 1,500 lines of changes to, to the Linux code, so it's not very pervasive or anything. <coughs> and we have the best case downtime we're seeing for, for, for an idle system is about 30 milliseconds. So actually, you can do this without users noticing. And, and for, for Big real life applications you can get up to like a couple of hundred milliseconds, but that's sort of it. And, and the nice thing about doing the self migration versus the traditional hosted migration is that we are inside the, the, the thing that's moving, so we can just in the scheduler, if there's a if there's a big number crunching process that's sort of dirtying up memory at a high rate, faster than what we can transfer, we can just slow this uh, just throttle him a little bit. And he'll just get up to full speed uh, on the new machine. And so there's also the way it's been implemented is that there's actually this is just a there's a special device node that means you can read a you can read a consistent checkpoint of your system from user space. So the idea is you just you, you just open this device and then you from there you just keep keep reading until you have a checkpoint. So this is this is sort of the act, an early version of the actual code that's running in user space. You just open the device, you open a socket, and you just read pages out of the system. And what you get is you get an integer saying this is page number something, and then there's a raw page data. And you just do that until either you get a zero return code, which means uh, that you're now on the other side of the, of the, uh, the fork on the, on the new machine. Or if you, if you get, uh, well, some other strictly zero value, which means you just need to shut down on the, uh, on the originating host. So all this stuff is, of course, all the, the hot stuff is in the, inside the kernel, but you can, you can have this in user space. So if you want to, Say if you want encrypted migration or compressed migration, or if you don't want migration at all, but you just want to do a checkpoint to disk, then you can just, instead of opening a socket, you just open the file. So there's just this one single performance figure. So up here, there's an example, and this is stop and copy migration of an OS. And you see, this is, <coughs> this is I just, I'm just running an iperf bandwidth meter, so it's, it's not a very good test, but just to show you that it's responsive. And so this is, this is what you get with normal stop and copy migration. <coughs> and this is what you get with, with a version of, of the self-migration. What you see here is this is where migration starts. And, and there's, there's a small performance drop because you have to go through all the page tables in the system and change the values. And then migration sort of starts. And I think this drop here is due to the TCP connection sort of picking up speed. And then, <coughs> but you see the system is, is still I mean, it's, it's still uh, very responsive in terms of bandwidth. And then you have the final drop. This is the downtime. Of course, it should reach zero, but the sampling rate is just not high enough to pick that up. And then now you have your, your system running, and it's running at full speed uh, on, the, on the next machine. So I'll just describe some of the stuff that we're doing on top of this. Is, uh, called what we call self-inflation. So all this, <coughs> all this is nice because now, now we can remove the TCP stack that sort of picks up the, 
OS and moves it to another machine. But if we want to sort of insert it and receive it at the other end, then we still need a TCP stack that does the receiving. <coughs> it sets up a new virtual machine and uh, receives all this data into it. So what we're trying to do now is, is what we call self-inflation. So, so the idea is that, that we set up a small, very small TCP stack inside a virtual machine. And we do that, we, we get a, we have a very small network interface for sort of instantiating this, this uh, small TCP stack. Uh, and we use that to, to, to handle the receiving side of the migration. So that the receiving side is also unprivileged and doesn't have to affect the size of the control pane software. So what we, have, we have the control pane software is, is a very small network stack, about 50 lines of code. And it's, it's basically, basically just handling ARP replies. So that means the thing has an IP address, but you cannot port scan it or anything because it doesn't run anything. And only then you send a, a special ICOMP. So you just send a, an IP packet with a special payload. And this payload is signed some, somehow saying that this guy should run. So, and, and once you do that, there's, there's a new TCP stack being spawned inside a new virtual machine. And, and, and so the guy who just sends the ICOMP, then he sends the, 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 sets up a TCP connection to the stack. And then first, actually, he uploads a small executable just to, to specify the protocol so that this is a migration and this is not encrypted, stuff like that. <clears throat> and then this protocol will then handle the incoming migration, setting up the, the full virtual machine, stuff like that. This code is, <coughs> so this, this code is, is in the control pane, so it could be in the VMM. So these, these 50 lines are somewhere that security-wise is as bad as having it in the VMM. Yes. Not necessarily in the control pane. Yeah, in the control pane software, which is sort of privileged virtual machine. But that's just practical reasons. You could put it in the VMM, or you could put it in this. Uh, so I mean, this, these 50 lines, I mean, if the, the guy doing the op reply, if you can find a bug there, you can take over the whole machine. So the, the hope is that if it's only 50 lines, then it's harder to find a bug or easier to find the bug and remove it. So, and then the, the, the TCP stack itself, it's, it's derived from a micro IP, which is a, a stack for embedded devices. So it doesn't use any threading or anything. It's, it's, really, it's really neat code. I think that, I didn't write that, so it's, I think it's like 5K binary, which is the TCP stack itself. And the rest is just the, the boot striving protocol and my clumsy coding. So, uh, and then there is some more stuff coming in, in the protocol. But the idea is that you can specify the protocol yourself. So if, if, you, if you don't want this to be a migration, if you want to use this for your first bootstrap, then perhaps you do, you upload something else. Or if you want to have, say, encryption, you, you upload something else. So, <clears throat> and this is hopefully all very nice and secure because we have now a system with very, very small network facing uh, privileged uh, attack surface or whatever you call it. So, but, but we want to use this for, I mean, what we want to use this for, as I said, is grid computing and clusters and stuff and, and letting people just submit jobs. So, so I guess I if, you, if you feel like running uh, your own web server or a big grid computation or whatever, then you sort of configure your own operating system image with, the, uh, with all the, the executables that you need and libraries, whatever. And then you upload, or you run this on your own machine and you migrate it into the cluster. And then in the cluster, perhaps you migrate it around in response to a sort of a better offer for, for resources or whatever. So you do this, there is no, I mean, these 50 lines of control pane software, they, do, they don't do anything. So then they don't decide that, oh, you should run somewhere else. I mean, if, perhaps there's some sort of uh, outside motivation factor saying that you can get cheaper resources somewhere else. But, but that's not, I mean, you, ha you have to, 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 to drag yourself along. <coughs> so so how, do you, how do you pay for this stuff? Um, and and this, is, this is fairly early stuff, so it's, it's not. Um, so again, what we want to do is we want to keep this simple. We don't want to, uh, now remove, we've removed the TCP stack from the sending side, we've removed it from the receiving side. So we don't want the, the, the accounting infrastructure to sort of create its own TCP stack and the security vulnerabilities. So, um, so we take our uh, inspiration from very successful systems in the real world called laundromats. And with laundromats, you have, you have systems that are sort of self-managing and uh, people pay to use them and they're actually kind of happy. 
And we try not to get too much into the deep economic, let's build a stock market kind of thing yet. So that's it to come. So if you look at what a laundromat does, well, it's sort of, you, give, you feed it tokens and it'll do your laundry. Uh, and you can manage, I mean, end users just manage laundromats. Uh, and at least in Denmark, you don't have anybody managing a laundromat hall. It's just, it's just a hole, and you just walk in there with your stuff, and you buy some tokens in the machine, and you just buy some detergent, and then just do your laundry. <coughs> so, um, so they're, they're, they're very, I mean, they're in a harsh environment, and still they, they manage to survive. And sometimes, perhaps, they eat your tokens or your laundry and your detergent or all of it. But, but that's, that's very infrequent, and your tokens are not that expensive, so you keep using laundromats. Maybe you go to another laundromat hall, but you don't stop using laundromats altogether. So we're thinking grid nodes, they could feed on crypto tokens instead of physical tokens. And they, they could also be managed by end users. And perhaps they, they could even, you could even allow them to refuse service every now and then if, if the crypto tokens were cheap enough. So, so these would be, would be the entities. You would have customers wanting to purchase uh, resources uh, on grid nodes. And you would have grid nodes or vendor nodes in e-commerce speak that would provide these very raw resources, just memory and disk, to the customer's network, I.O. And then the customer would run virtual machines on these things. And then finally, you would have the token vending machines or the brokers or whatever. So you would, they, they, would, they would sell you the, the, the tokens. And the idea is that, of course, you want credit card clearing and fancy e-commerce stuff, but you would just have that on, on, on one machine, or you would just put that at a, in a Yahoo store or whatever. So, so the, the individual nodes don't have any of this, but then you have maybe a, a web server selling this stuff, or where is the sale? So you have, you have the user here um, asking the broker to sell him some, some, some tokens to, to, for, to run some computation. And then the, the broker will just say, well, you can run on, on this machine. <clears throat> and then you, the user will, will send this bootstrap token and, and the ICOM payload to this 40, 50 line uh, network code down there. And then if that's cleared OK, then there will be a, a real TCP stack set up for him. And he'll do that to migrate his stuff in there or to bootstrap his, his stuff uh, onto, the, onto the node. So that's very simple. So the guarantees that we are making is that trying to make is that you have perfect isolation. You, 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 you don't have, uh, if you have two virtual machines running on the same machine, they, they cannot introspect each other's memory or modify their state in any way. And also, people pay. I mean, they, everything is upfront. So you, you have to provide payment upfront. So you saw that there was, I mean, there's not even a TCP site running for you if you didn't pay for it. And, and also, of course, I mean, that's just to get you started, but you'll have to keep feeding this thing tokens. Uh, because if you don't, then you'll just get garbage collected right away. So, so, the, the, so the, the user VM needs to keep monitoring its, its uh, token state all the time. So it needs to know, did I pay enough? And it has to make the trade-off, should I buy like a million tokens ahead just to make sure I don't run out? Or should I buy not so many to make sure I don't lose a lot of tokens if the grid node dies? And then, there, of course, there should be no backdoors if we can agree on these 50 lines of code. <coughs> so this is, I'm not a crypto expert at all. So this is an example of what you could do for a, a, a simple token system. So you realize that, that your first icon that you send would be signed somehow. And that would specify the start of a hash chain. So a hash chain would mean that you had a, a function like SHA or MD5 that you cannot revert. So you start, you start with a big secret. And then you derive values by applying this function to the secret a number of times. And so you, you start with the, the outermost value. You just, that's part of the bootstrap. And you can, then the user has to, to keep supplying secrets of the chain. So that's, I mean, that's, that's an example of how you can do this with very few bits and very low, low computation overhead. But really, that's, I mean, what you decide to do. But that's the stuff that we're currently implementing. So the initial bootstrap token gives you the, the, the outermost secret in this chain, and then you need to supply uh, newer secrets of the chain closer to the original secret. Does it make sense? Yeah. But that's just one way of doing it. But the idea is you keep paying in advance, but, but you don't pay that much that 
if there's a disaster, you, you maybe you lost, say, a dollar of computation, and it'll just live with it and not start to sue anyone. <coughs> so these are not real tokens in the sort of subway system token sense. These are just things that you use for one specific machine. So that means there will be no double spending. You know, it's very easy to check for. Uh, and you keep inserting them, and the, the, the VMM will keep reducing your balance as you consume resources, but only as you consume. So there is some kind of passing model saying that one meg of memory costs, costs so much for one second, or the CPU costs so much. So, so the idea is that you should just, I mean, the, the, the guest operating system is, should be motivated to, to keep their resource consumption low because they pay for it. Uh, and if you run out, well, you're gone. So this is an example of <coughs> now a job ran out of tokens. So where does it get more from? It, it, cannot, it, it could contact the broker directly, but that would mean it would need to have stuff like your credit card information inside it. And you don't want your credit card information inside something that's running on a foreign node. Like you don't want to carry all the money you own in cash in Venezuela. So, so, so the idea is you, you, you need to communicate to, to your trusted uh, home system, like, like the users on PC. And you sort of send an email home saying, send more tokens. And then the user would, would look at it and say, oh, you're making good progress. You're not being ripped off or anything. So I'll, I'll go to the bank and buy more tokens for you. And then you can, you can have them and, and keep running. So that's the model. So it's, not, it's sort of moving all the, this, the, the, the heavy security stuff away from, from the grid nodes and from the customer VMs because they're, they're in, in sort of harsh conditions where they, they cannot be trusted. So you still need to trust the program. I mean, you will need, say, Rackspace. You, you have to trust them that they don't do bad stuff with your machines. And so that would be brands building around this stuff. And that would be real role, role brands. So. Or you could have some kind of trust model on that. But I'm not into this stuff. And you, you don't buy too many tokens in advance. And you don't lose too many tokens. And you can adjust token pricing. Uh, over time, so if you, if you want to move people to another machine, you can turn up the price of tokens. Or if you want to keep resource consumption low during daytime, whatever, you can have more expensive tokens during daytime, or you can imagine all sorts of stuff. <coughs> so a little bit related work. There is a VMware ESX server that has a thing called vMotion that does operating system migration, which is uh, an example of hosted migration. And there is a uh, hosted migration now in, in Zen 2.0. Um, and we did a, a, a paper with these guys comparing our approaches. There was microdenality doing some, some uh, a little bit of uh, migration stuff uh, from, from University of Washington at the NSDI this year. But they had downtimes like 10, 20 seconds for, to do a migration, so they didn't really address the downtime issue at all. And then there was, there was uh, the first system that we did a few years ago, which was a system built on the L4 microkernel from um, Dresden and Karlsruhe in Germany. And that was, I think, was, was the first example of using, doing a live pre-copy migration of operating systems at all. We had a system there we, that would do actually 10 milliseconds of downtime at, at the time because that was, that was hosted migration. So, but that also led us to conclude that there was too many problems with hosted migration that you should do that way. So stuff that we don't really address right now is, is block devices. Uh, we found out we, we don't really have to address it because there's so much stuff going on in, in uh, network attack storage, like iSCSI and whatever, so you can just use that. Uh, so we should probably try and clean that up a little bit. And there is a lot of funny work in, in uh, mobile IP, connection migration, that stuff, and hopefully someone will solve that. And then we should do some more uh, production runs. We have some very large clusters. Uh, so hopefully we can be allowed to, to run some, some real experience there. And then there's plenty of fancy economic thinking about stock markets and fluctuations and all that stuff that we might get into in the future. That's it. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? What, what part of the work of this do you think is the largest contribution? <coughs> so I think uh, the self-migration part, I think, is uh, when, I, when I said when I came to Cambridge to say, let's, let's do self-migration, people were like, well, you can't do that. Uh, and I think if you think about it, of course you can do it, because it's a bit like hibernation. And it's, uh, so I think uh, sort of the thinking, it, it's, it's very end-to-end -end 
argument uh, oriented. I think it's sort of the thinking that you should just push all this functionality all the way up the stack to, to the, the guest operating system. And, and the, the, the results you get that, that you can now um, get this, I say, a, a 40 line contr uh, privilege control pane, I think is very good for security. So I think, I think self-migration is sort of the, the core thing here. And, and the other stuff is the stuff that we're building because we now have self-migration. So, so we, just, we still don't know if people are going to do operating system migration at all. But I think if, if you want to do uh, stuff like preemption across a, a cluster, then you need, and you still want to keep running Unix programs or Windows programs, then you need something like this. So I guess that, that, would, that would be the stuff that I think is a contribution. So, yeah, I didn't talk much about that. So the, the problem, I think, one of the reasons process migration never took off in the 80s is you have the problem of residual dependencies. So if you have open files on a machine and you move the process and you cannot, you cannot move the files because they share it with someone or, I mean, it's just very hard to do that with the complexity of, of Unix. It's like organ transplantation between humans. It's possible, but sometimes it just goes wrong. Okay, so Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, and you could say, I mean, the operating system in, in a virtual machine monitor is just a class of process. So this is process migration within your face. Uh, uh, so if you do the granularity of, of migration, you can be building it down all the way down to the object level, and there are applications where moving individual small objects makes sense, and there are applications where it makes more sense to move at the process level, and others where we're just picking up the whole kit and moving it. I think that there's merit to the process. So, yeah. And, uh, you asked what the, what the important contribution was, and, and one of the things I'm impressed with is that, wait a minute, slide migration and on into the NoSec thing. That means I can run a gaming server? Yeah, you can run. We did stuff like migrate quite quick servers or video streaming servers and stuff like that, and, and still being responsible. And it's not noticeable to users. So that's, I mean, that's very nice. At least in the machine room, that's nice. You can you can just uh, reschedule stuff without having to worry about uh, upsetting anyone. So. Uh, and then, then I could also ask if anyone has any comments on this uh, um, resource rental and payment type of thing that we're looking at. Because you're really trying to isolate the, the actual mechanisms for getting the right to run on some virtual machine from all this payment and the policies and all that. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's, I'm not a crypto guy at all, so it's just. And there's two questions. One, yeah. can you do it simpler? And two, is, is even this actually have security properties? Yeah, yeah, want? yeah. Uh, this is pretty darn simple. I don't know if you can get anything <laughs> much more simple <laughs> yeah. Well, otherwise, thanks.